Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Doc Talks. I know many of you have invested in the work we do, and I'm delighted you can be with us today. My name is Megan, and I'm a gift officer with the Providence St. Vincent Foundation. Today, we'll hear from and discuss the important work of ethics and healthcare from the bedside to the boardroom. I'm inspired by the work the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics is doing to address ethical issues across the continuum of care focusing on ethical issues in the care of patients of diverse faith, spirituality, and cultural traditions. The center aspires to call attention to those whose future is most at risk and rally remedies to their vulnerabilities. The Ethics Center does this through clinical consultations with care teams and also through ethics education. I have the honor to introduce two of our incredible ethicists today. Dr. Nicholas Cockler is the Vice President for System Ethics Services in the Theology and Ethics Department of Providence St. Joseph Health. In this role, he helps to integrate the ethical decision-making across the Providence enterprise and supports ethicists across Providence's regions in empowering and enabling caregivers and core leaders to identify and address ethical issues. Dr. Cockler is currently authoring the upcoming fifth edition of his book, An Introduction to Bioethics. He holds an interdepartmental doctorate in healthcare ethics, as well as graduate degrees in philosophy and bio biotechnology. You'll also be hearing from Kevin Dirksen, who has served as a senior ethicist and director for the ethics education at the Center for Healthcare Ethics. Later this week, we'll be announcing his recent appointment as regional director of ethics in Oregon. Congratulations to Kevin. His role includes working with the internal medicine and family medicine residency programs for ethics education, as well as providing clinical and organizational ethics consultations throughout the Oregon region of Providence St. Joseph Health. Kevin also engages in clinical ethics research and scholarship, representing the work of the center in professional publications and conferences internationally. Kevin holds an advanced graduate degree in biomedical ethics and professional graduate degree in theology specializing in ethics and health. Now, let's welcome Dr. Nick Cockler and Kevin Dirksen. Thank you, Megan, for that lovely introduction. And uh, again, congratulations, Kevin, on your, your new role. You know, I want to begin uh, by sharing a little bit uh, with you what is an ethicist and what do we do at the Ethics Center? Uh, I often get the question, you know, what do you do for a living? And when I respond with, well, I'm an ethicist, I get the, well, that's interesting. What does that mean? Kind of question uh, or response. And I would say that the role of the ethicist is to be a helper, a friend, someone who accompanies those who are making the medical decisions and, and who are wrestling with the moral issues, the heroes, if you will, of our stories. At the Ethics Center, we do this through a myriad of ways uh, where we try to empower and enable our caregivers and leaders to identify and address ethical issues within their roles. We have uh, our history and our origin story at the center is rooted in medical education with the St. Vincent Medical Center's uh, internal medicine residency program nearly 20 years ago. We provide all the ethics education for four residency programs here in Oregon. We have a series of named lectureships that we put on throughout the year. We have an ethics core program that uh, provides our caregivers an opportunity to learn and to deepen their knowledge of ethics uh, in cl clinical medicine, in, clin in, in medicine. We have a ref reference library that includes a, a, a number of holdings, periodicals, and digital resources. What you'll hear today is a story that comes from our consultation service, something that we do uh, throughout the year uh, and uh, averaging at about uh, 350 to 400 uh, consults uh, in the state of Oregon alone. We also provide mission discernments, mission and values discernments to our organizational leaders when there's a major uh, business decision that has to be made. We provide ethics committee support and we also in integrate with uh, clinical practice in various other ways. As a Catholic faith-based organization, we also work with our church leadership and our mission colleagues. And we also perform some civic engagements, including uh, advocacy for legislation and, uh, and other uh, civic uh, re related uh, activities. 
So to anchor our conversation this morning uh, or this afternoon, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, who will share a story from our, our recent uh, work. Uh, and this is a, uh, a story of, a, of an ethics consult uh, in the hospital. And I would encourage you to think about what your response is to this situation and how you, may, how you would explain your decision uh, to your friends or family. So Kevin? Thanks, Nick. It's uh, hard to find the mute button when uh, you start sharing a screen. So uh, <laughs> thanks for the uh, patience there. So again, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, so pleased for the opportunity to uh, think through uh, how to approach some of these uh, challenging uh, situations that come up in the healthcare context uh, with Nick and uh, our partners from uh, Providence Foundation. So thanks for the opportunity. So uh, a play on uh, the Olympics, just wrapping up here, uh, I titled this case, uh, Field Notes from the Cardiac Olympiad, uh, What to Do About an Unwanted Pacemaker. And again, would, uh, with Nick's uh, helpful introduction to think about uh, how would you uh, begin the process of thinking through aspects of uh, this clinical case. Uh, if uh, you were one of the healthcare team members involved, if you were a family member involved, or perhaps uh, a loved one that's hearing uh, reports that we sometimes do when we have uh, someone who's admitted to the hospital. Think through how would you approach uh, the key ethical issues in this case? How would you think about um, what it is is most important? And uh, we'll uh, use this case to kind of ground our discussion um, today. So Geraldine is a 96-year-old woman with a family history of Alzheimer's disease who lives with her daughter in Portland. Before retirement, Geraldine worked as a County Associate Director of Health in California, and more recently enjoys going to the park and feeding the birds and squirrels. Five years ago, she was seen by her primary care physician, who at that appointment recommended she go to the emergency room since the patient was short of breath for several days, including having a complaint of swelling in both legs for the last few months. When she's admitted to the hospital, she's seen by cardiology, who recommends a pacemaker be placed, which is placed before she leaves the hospital. It's also during this hospitalization that a cognitive screening assessment is performed, which scores the patient in dementia range. Now in 2021, Geraldine suffers from severe dementia. Since her pacemaker has been placed, her care has been coordinated in the primary care setting, not requiring much in terms of hospitalization or placement. She still lives with her daughter. However, she suffered a stroke earlier this year and is now hospitalized again for presumed recurrent strokes. Given the patient's heart disease, severe dementia, and recurrent cerebrovascular events. The physician caring for the patient in the hospital orders a consult with the connections team. Also referred to as a palliative care consult, this team helps patients and families determine their goals for medical care in light of the patient's specific situation. Ultimately, as a result of this consult and other conversations with the medical team, the patient's daughter agrees that Geraldine would wanna focus on comfort and palliation as opposed to life prolongation at all costs and a hospice discharge is considered. It's then that a new physician responsible for the patient's care comes onto the service and notices that the patient's pacemaker had not featured in discussions this hospitalization. Unsure, given the shift in goals of care toward comfort and palliation and perhaps home on hospice, the physician is unsure whether to recommend pacemaker deactivation. And so the physician brings this up with Geraldine's daughter. The daughter reflects that the last year has been really difficult on her mom and knows that her quality of life is not what it used to be. While she cares deeply for her mom and struggles to imagine her gone, she knows her mom would not want her life to be prolonged 
and that an allow natural death approach would be in her best interest. Specifically, she thinks her mom would not want the pacemaker to remain active and worries that this remaining might prolong suffering. It's at that time that the patient and daughter agree that it is the right decision for the patient to turn off the pacemaker. But when the physician, now responsible for the patient's care, calls cardiology, the consultant said that we don't turn off pacemakers, and the device manufacturer says that they are not allowed to do this. Ethics is contacted, given the physician's moral distress about this situation. So back to the play on the Olympics. Once the torch is lit, is it okay to extinguish the flame? Thank you, Kevin, for that story. Um, before we uh, discuss this case and how an ethicist might approach it, I again invite you as the audience to reflect on how would you respond to this question? What is the right decision for this patient and her family? Is it turning off and deactivating the pacemaker? Is it keeping it on? And pay attention to the reasons why you make that decision. This will give you a clue into how ethicists think about uh, the decision-making in, in cases like this. So Kevin, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if you were on the receiving end of this consultation, if you could walk, walk us through that initial, initial discussion with the provider who's asking for your help. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I, I mean, a case like this uh, is always um, fundamentally unique in that you'll never have the same patient, you'll never have the same family, you'll never have the same history, uh, the same current uh, situation. Um, and so every case, uh, I think, demands um, some real humility in terms of uh, trying to figure out how can we most gracefully enter um, and with humility, uh, try to be that helper uh, that you talked about earlier. So um, while there are typical questions that we ask and typical ways of engaging, I think it's helpful to set that stage because uh, as I think many of us can think about, um, we've perhaps not been in this situation, but we've been in other situations where we've had a loved one receive medical care. I think back to uh, my fellowship in clinical ethics and just three months into my training, uh, my first uh, child was born and unfortunately required uh, the, ability, the, the need to go to the NICU, uh, the neonatal intensive care unit due to um, some issues breathing. And I always will remember that because it was a situation that emotions just flooded over me. Uh, she didn't need to go on a ventilator. Uh, her prognosis was good, but still uh, she was going to a place that I barely understood uh, and was uh, about to receive uh, care in a place that, as a, a budding clinical ethicist, uh, frightened me, uh, frightened me deeply. Uh, and so, again, I think it's important to remember that grounding. Um, we never just enter in into a textbook case study, but we enter into someone's lives um, and uh, caregivers who work really hard to try to find the best way uh, that they can take care of their patient. In a case like this, it's important to uh, not begin uh, with this notion of what the right ethics answer is here. Uh, is it okay to turn the pacemaker off or not? Uh, these things tend to uh, start bubbling up for us and probably start bubbling up for others uh, if the chat box already is any guide. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, it's important for us to clarify um, how it is that we can be of help uh, in this situation. Uh, it may be that uh, due to a variety of reasons, um, how medicine can be a challenging uh, place to practice and coordinate care that we've not had an ability to get folks around the table and decide what really is best uh, for the patient. And so sometimes ethics might be consulted before that uh, connections meeting or palliative care consult as I described in the case. And it might make sense to spend a little bit more time with the patient's uh, chosen decision maker, their family, their loved ones, and finding out um, how they can uh, best provide care um, for the patient. Uh, it may also be the case that those uh, patients, um, of course, um, uh, will uh, can, can get dementia and that can impact their medical care. 
Uh, they may also still have preferences that we need to help solicit. And so sometimes we'll jump into a case where the patient's own voice uh, will seem secondary or supplemental or adjacent um, to uh, the dialogue that's been occurring between the primary team and cardiology or between the nursing staff and the family. And so sometimes uh, by uh, having an ethics consult, we can sort of uh, re-engage and focus um, on what matters. And so I think my first um, uh, goal in a case like this, Nick, would be to uh, ask the question of how can ethics be of help? Um, what is the goal um, of getting us involved? Uh, sometimes that also differs based upon who is getting us involved. Um, we've had consults from specialists like cardiology who are trying to tease out, can I do what's been requested of us or not? Uh, sometimes from uh, connections, our palliative care team asking about, uh, should we bring this up? If so, how should we bring this up? Uh, as well as the primary team, nursing staff, and even patients and family members uh, will reach out to us as well. Um, and so it's important to clarify uh, who's getting us involved, uh, why are we um, uh, requested to get involved? And then I think some professional uh, discernment about how can we be of most help uh, in this patient's case. And uh, depending upon what that question is, depending upon uh, what the sort of a clinical and moral landscape might be, uh, will help tee us up uh, what the, the fitting next steps uh, are in a case like this. Great, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, if I can ask to, to show the slides uh, one more time, uh, what I often find myself referring to is, uh, or asking, what does ethics bring to the table? And uh, generally speaking, uh, our philosophy at the center has been to see how uh, ethics can transform the technical skill and knowledge that caregivers have into healthcare, into professional practices, and, uh, and uh, the healing professions. We hope we do this by uh, offering a degree of, of practical wisdom uh, or prudence and avoiding default decisions. Uh, we hope that we can bring a, a degree of integrity into the decision-making process, the sense of a wholeness or completeness with regard to the various values and principles and facts at play while at the same time managing the various moral hazards. And that uh, is a te technical term of art that means, what are those barriers to our ability to fulfill our obligations? What gets in the way of us doing the right thing? And how do we manage those things, those temptations or those barriers? And finally, we hope we bring a degree of peace, uh, peace of mind, peace of heart uh, to those who are requesting our services by addressing and managing moral distress. Uh, moral distress is again, one of those, uh, another term of art that means an emotionally distressing situation because someone's integrity is at risk. An emotionally distressing response to when one's integrity is at risk. So Kevin, if I could invite you, uh, when you reflect on this case, what might be some default decisions that uh, the team is facing in response to the, the, the events as you describe them? Yeah, I think, you know, one, Nick, that uh, stares us right in the face is this notion of uh, we don't do that, right? Um, or uh, we do do that. Uh, we do it all the time. And we'll just pop in there, turn off the pacemaker and be out of it. Uh, and so, you know, the default decisions can range anywhere between, um, you know, things that um, I sort of feel like they're in a groove in a lane for us, um, but uh, do we need to take a step back and do we need to ask the question of, does this fit uh, this patient's clinical situation? And, you know, it may be the case that, uh, again, you know, we can hypothesize on a myriad of reasons why a, a hypothetical cardiologist may have said, uh, we don't turn off the pacemaker, but you know, querying that a little bit more, I think, can always be of help. Um, one of the most common reasons for getting ethics involved in the healthcare context uh, is a question of um, we're, we're perhaps uh, being asked to do something that doesn't feel right um, for our patient. Um, we're asked to provide care, for instance, at the end of life uh, that may be more harmful than helpful um, by uh, perhaps a family member who 
uh, is coming in and not understanding the medical condition, um, not uh, um, on the same page as the healthcare team, what have you. And you know, so in that default decision, what I'm always asking um, uh, team members is why? Uh, what, what is motivating uh, a patient or their family member in requesting a treatment that we don't feel great about? Um, and so, you know, I think a follow-up question to a cardiologist like this could be, um, why? Why don't we turn pacemakers off? Can you tell me a little bit more? Is this something that uh, you experienced in your training? Uh, if so, how long ago was your training? Um, how up-to-date is this with uh, the current literature, uh, best practices, consensus statements, uh, society guidelines, etc.? Uh, it may also be uh, a, uh, a statement based around um, uh, an area that one doesn't feel comfortable in. Um, it happens so rarely, so infrequently that, boy, it's almost like a procedure that I'm not uh, competent enough to perform. Uh, I, I don't do that. Um, so again, you know, tell me more. Is there somebody on the team that we normally turn to when these cases or questions come up? You know, is it a potential um, that we're running into a situation where a provider is issuing a, a conscientious objection um, that it might be clear uh, that pacemakers can indeed be turned off uh, both clinically, uh, ethically, and maybe even add illegally to that. Um, however, uh, there are places where uh, as professionals and persons that we may be asked to do something that we feel um, is morally wrong of us as a person. Um, and so is, in fact, uh, this proceduralist uh, opting out on the basis of conscience. So again, I think a default decision would be uh, just to issue that. We don't do that. Um, or even to accept that um, as dogma, as opposed to, well, we need a little bit more information. Um, it's the classic, tell me more, uh, that I think serves many of us well in relationships as parents. Uh, and even when we're uh, in the healthcare setting, uh, getting uh, getting care from our docs and nurses. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I think, um, uh, how can I be helpful? And uh, please tell me more, help me understand our uh, uh, important tools in the ethicist toolbox, uh, especially at the get-go. So I'm wondering, Kevin, if you could share a little bit about your thoughts on, on the images on, on this slide and, and how it relates to ethics consultation. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I, I, this is for me is uh, something I've uh, uh, borrowed. It's a phone a friend, if you will. Uh, this is a, a way that uh, uh, when I joined Providence uh, uh, seven years ago that uh, you shared with me some of your uh, reflections on how you think about uh, the situations that uh, result in an ethics consult and that they uh, may be a result of either some kind of disruption in care delivery um, and or a place where the accountability uh, for a given decision uh, is affecting us as a moral agent. And so uh, that being the case, uh, I've used this uh, paradigm uh, with our, our learners in the ethics education space to kind of help tee out, you know, what's going on here? I mean, are we feeling like this is a place where uh, we're feeling an undue sort of moral burden of the weight of the decision in ways that we don't need to necessarily think about how are we going to help the team get the care plan back on track? But we need to attend to the moral agents that are involved and help provide them the support they need to think through a given uh, question, a given dilemma, uh, and find a way of responding. That is also very different from a place where, for instance, we may have a disruption in care delivery, that uh, we've got a patient um, who uh, needs a procedure, um, but we don't have anyone to consent. Um, so the care quickly grinds to a halt and we need to find out uh, who is the decision maker for this patient or by what means can the care they need uh, be otherwise duly authorized. Um, this can serve as an either or, um, that sometimes the accountability um, is uh, solely you know, the feature of what's going on. Sometimes it's a disruption um, or sometimes it's both. And I would argue that in a case like this, there's, there's kind of both going on. Um, that there is a disruption that we've had a request from this patient's decision maker to uh, in dialogue with the, the treating provider to turn off the pacemaker, but we don't have a pathway to do that. Um, and in addition, uh, the accountability for these decisions and the moral weight of knowing that this is something that I think as a physician feels right and the family agrees, but I don't have a pathway to do it. And so 
the, the moral distress that can ensue from there as well being a prominent feature um, in a case like this. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I, I think um, one of the ways I have framed this has been um, to think of uh, ethical issues uh, as the what I would call the moral turbulence that gets in the way of uh, appropriate, quality, safe, effective uh, patient care. And so, you know, as we think about that and, and think about those two domains of, of uh, trying to uh, ensure a smooth um, delivery of care that's uh, responsible and to attend to the sense of accountability for one's decisions. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about how we have integrated ourselves in, uh, in, ethic, in uh, clinical practice. Um, you know, if we rewind the clock to the uh, 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, you know, the birth of the field of bioethics, uh, you know, there weren't uh, degree programs in healthcare ethics or bioethics. And here we are um, with whole departments and FTEs with that job title and that job description. So I'm wondering if you could uh, share a little bit about how we think about the um, ways in which caregivers, uh, thought leaders, uh, trusted colleagues, and ethicists all work together in, in the clinical space. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, I'll just provide a quick word or two um, of uh, general context and then share a little bit about how we've thought about this at the Ethics Center. So, I mean, it's been quite a long time, though, several decades since there were uh, these initial cases around, uh, can we turn off um, a life-sustaining treatment that has been started for a patient? Is it ever uh, morally permissible to stop um, artificial nutrition and hydration, to stop a patient from receiving um, uh, nutrition via a feeding tube? Or is it ever appropriate to turn off a ventilator for a patient whose lung functions are being supported on a breathing machine? And you know, it was really through that, those cases and the, the judicial reflection that, hey, uh, maybe it's not the place to consider these individual, these intimate patient care uh, questions uh, in the court system, which takes a long time, is clunky, um, and doesn't necessarily uh, result in the kind of nuanced approach that um, healthcare ethics often requires, that we need to punt these, uh, some of these questions back to local ethics committees. And so that's really the time when we started seeing um, hospitals pull together groups that maybe didn't have a, a professionally trained uh, clinical ethicist since there really weren't any at the time. There were some out there that helped uh, respond to some of these issues. But you know, that was really the, the birth of the ethics committee was the start of a, uh, I think, path toward professionalism um, that uh, is starting to become a bit more dominant in the field today, which means that you know, perhaps in a case like this, um, a given question about turning off a pacemaker for a, a woman with dementia um, as assisted by her loved one in the decision-making process um, maybe convening a committee that meets at the end of the month and reviewing this question and then getting back to the team isn't the most effective way to go. Um, maybe we can have folks that uh, have an extra um, uh, set of experience of education, of training to be able to respond to these issues um, in real time. And you know, so we offer um, our ethics consultation of Providence on that basis. Um, so here in Oregon, we have professionally trained ethicists that serve as the sort of first responders uh, for the moral fires that uh, may rage on the wards or in the ICUs or in other lines of business. And we might partner with our ethics committees and partner with others to be able to uh, respond to those issues. Uh, I guess that's a little longer than a word. Uh, how we apply that at Providence um, you know, is also to say that uh, one of the best ways to uh, respond to the moral issues that occur in patient care is not to wait till it's a five alarm fire, uh, but instead to try to provide ethics education to our clinicians to be able to practice at the maximum level of their professional competency. So that um, while they might not uh, be able to perform an ethics consult on their own, that if they're the nurse involved, they know the kinds of questions that they should be asking. They know the kinds of principles that ought to be balanced. And so in these situations, um, it's really important and helpful for us to rely on um, our well-trained clinical colleagues who, through the Ethics Center's mission in ethics education, 
um, has uh, uh, over the last 20 years um, helped train um, our clinicians uh, to by and large practice at a higher level of ethical competency than maybe when they popped out of med school or nursing school or other professional training programs. So a way that we've talked about this internally at the center is to think of ethics consultation as sort of a specialty service with uh, uh, experts professionally trained to do that work, to be available to our caregivers when needed, but also to uh, engage others who are part of our uh, community of, of caregivers who have some training, who have some um, ethical uh, aptitude and who are there as a, as a resource for caregivers who are directly providing care, uh, who may have the questions. So as you see in this slide, we, we generally think of the, 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 the primary source of ethical decision-making is within that therapeutic relationship uh, between the caregivers and, and the patient and family. But there are all these other layers that can, be wrap, can wrap around uh, support for those who are most uh, proximate to uh, the decision at hand. Um, a consult can look like a variety of, uh, th there's no uh, cookie cutter uh, consult. Um, the format is variable. It really depends on the case. Um, here at the center, we use a decision-making model that looks at uh, four fundamental questions. What's the honest practice of medicine or the you know, evidence-based quality care that's appropriate for this clinical um, set of conditions? How are we dependable to benefit the patient from our uh, interventions? How are we fair to patients in their context? So understanding the patient, not just as a patient with a diagnosis, but as a person, a whole person who comes with values and history and culture and uh, perhaps a faith tradition. How do we honor all of that? And then finally, justice and maleficence, uh, what other obligations do we have to attend to in terms of others' interests or in terms of protecting the patient, staff, or others from harm? And then we, we uh, for a specific identifiable patient, uh, we do document in the uh, electronic medical record. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, um, uh, edit our slides on the fly here. Um, ethics consults here in Oregon are available across the continuum of care, as you heard earlier, in the hospital, in our clinics and specialty uh, 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 services, and out in the home and community. So in our PACE program, in our home hospice program, and the like. Uh, caregivers can request a consult in a variety of ways. They can call or message us, they can page us, or they can enter a referral. And if, uh, if you were wondering what that all looks like, it all happened this morning. I received a call, I received a, a text message, I received a page and an, uh, a, an epic order for a consult. So these mechanisms are all live and well uh, in our system today. Kevin? Yeah, I think a good place for us to uh, wrap up and then drop the slides is maybe a bit of a humorous reminder that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, with Nick's uh, softball question about uh, uh, how do we um, operationalize uh, ethics um, across the field, but also specifically at Providence, uh, I've used this uh, a collection of graphic tees to illustrate for those uh, sci-fi or Star Wars fans among you. Um, that uh, we are not the committee, uh, despite the fact that this gets colloquially whenever we're involved in a consult. So the ethics committee said that, or the family describes, oh, I participated in an ethics committee meeting. Um, we do have ethics committees. Uh, we're, we're not them. Uh, we appreciate the hard work of our colleagues in volunteering their time. And uh, we also uh, distinguish a little bit um, that, uh, that, that that's not us in the performance of a consult. So, you know, pivoting back uh, very quickly to this case, um, uh, again, I've seen uh, evals for ethics presentations enough to know that if we don't tell you um, how a, a case uh, wrapped up, that that can, uh, at minimum, leave a bit of a dissatisfying uh, feeling among you. I um, mean, so, you know, I, one of the reasons why um, we use this case is because I think that uh, many folks can recognize the um, uh, sort of dilemma. Um, how do we think about things that may have been initiated uh, earlier um, in a patient's care 
uh, when it no longer uh, is appropriate uh, to continue that and how do we navigate, whether it's a pacemaker or some other uh, medical treatment. And so I think intuitively, maybe I'm hoping uh, most of us can understand um, the situation that the patient, that her family, um, and that the treating team found themselves in. But also, a um, uh, little uh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, this was not a case that ethics was involved proactively uh, in the form of a consult, um, as uh, Nick and I had been uh, discussing. Instead, we were alerted to this case uh, more retrospectively in our capacity as uh, uh, assisting with the uh, medical education from an ethics point of view um, of our trainees. And so we worked with uh, the faculty and others um, on a case presentation and discussion about uh, teachable moments in this case. And what ended up happening was that this was a physician um, who had been involved in ethics consults before, including a case around pacemaker deactivation. Uh, this was a clinician who was aware um, that it can in fact be appropriate uh, to turn off a pacemaker for a patient. And so uh, while I stopped the narrative where I did, uh, this physician didn't stop um, and, and kept um, moving forward and finding out, well, how are we going to do this uh, for our patient? And so uh, she ended up calling up the device manufacturer again and saying, I need you to come on site. Um, and we need to figure this out together because this is the right thing for the patient. Uh, some discussions once the device manufacturer was on site or a representative from the device manufacturer, there was a plan to put together to make sure uh, all of uh, the folks involved were comfortable with the decision, which they were, including the cardiologist who had previously said, we don't do that, uh, ultimately signed off on um, this, this approach. Um, and what eventually occurred was uh, this physician had to push hard and demonstrated what I might call moral courage in encountering um, uh, some significant moral hazards to getting uh, her patient the care she needs, um, but um, in the end was able um, to successfully navigate that uh, for her patient without um, the sort of intimate support from ethics in a consult. So this case occurred on the weekend, on a holiday weekend. Um, and so like many situations, uh, you can't farm off all the ethical dilemmas to the ethicists um, and our teams have to navigate these. And, uh, and, and luckily this was a case where um, the proactive engagement really worked. And so uh, I'd like to make a call out to our residency uh, physician who was involved in this case, Dr. Mira Jane, uh, and thank her for her moral courage and for demonstrating uh, an example to all of us that uh, from the standpoint of how we think about ethics consultations and our teaching represents something of uh, a hero's journey. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the archetype of the hero's journey uh, in seminal narratives. Um, and uh, if you haven't, uh, feel free to uh, uh, pop Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey into your uh, favorite uh, search engine um, and uh, find an illuminating way of thinking of some of those major archetypes around um, uh, major narratives. And so in this case, the ethicist wasn't the hero's journey. And in most cases, uh, in ethics consults, the ethicist is not the hero's journey. But we uh, sometimes serve as that sage, that guide that helps the hero navigate um, to where they need to be. And so with that, I'll uh, kick it back to Megan, who I think is going to help us get into uh, the Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kevin and Nick, for sharing this case with us and a little bit about your daily work uh, with Providence and the Ethics Center. And um, we're going to go ahead and take some question and answers. You still have time if you do have questions. Go ahead and enter those in the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, but we'll start with our first question from Adrian Simmons, um, who asks, how will ICU beds be allocated if we're out of beds or staff due to COVID? Will those with other ailments be out of luck? So I will, uh, Kevin conveniently turned off his camera and went on mute. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, attempt an initial answer here. Um, you know, when, when the uh, health systems and health authorities at, in various states uh, saw the potential for public health emergency with prior pandemics, many of those guidelines um, sought to uh, initiate a triage decision-making process that, that acknowledged that people will come to the hospital for care 
who may not be the victim or a casualty of the public health emergency or crisis. So uh, generally speaking, triage decision-making procedures acknowledge that whatever the process is, it has to be um, uh, able to uh, evaluate all patients who are coming for any reason. So strictly speaking, um, patients who are presenting to the hospital in need of critical care for COVID are going to be evaluated alongside patients who are presenting due to a cardiac arrest or a stroke. So the, the, the triage decision-making tools that are available and the principles behind them uh, generally aim to evaluate the relative likelihood of survival to discharge uh, irrespective of the cause of their ailments and uh, to work from that stratification to prioritize critical care resources. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I think that uh, it's the dilemma of our times, right? And uh, there were uh, lots of um, uh, places around the country that mobilized uh, groups of experts and um, uh, ways of soliciting community feedback uh, to various proposals uh, back uh, during the start of the pandemic. And uh, unfortunately, with what we're seeing due to uh, the surge of the Delta variant, uh, there are um, health systems and regions that are encountering this dilemma uh, yet again today. Um, which is a reminder of the importance of uh, thinking through from a public health standpoint, uh, what do we owe our neighbor um, and how can we uh, engage for the health and well-being of those who are most uh, vulnerable, uh, including our very tired um, and um, uh, exhausted healthcare workers that uh, need all the support they can and the relief that they can to be able to continue to care for patients both uh, COVID vaccinated and unvaccinated alike, or whether due to uh, the ongoing infectious disease pandemic or other causes, motor vehicle um, or, or other issues. Yeah, thank you for those thoughtful responses. Um, one more question comes from Eileen Mooney, who is asking, um, you know, you've talked already about the uh, consultation services uh, that Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics offers. Can you tell us a little bit about what distinguishes um, your center from other similar operations nationwide? So I think there's a, there's a few distinctive uh, aspects of how we've um, worked in the field of healthcare ethics at Providence. Uh, one of them is we have a, a I would argue, a best in class uh, range of programming and services, uh, consult services and the like. Uh, and which is um, unusual for a community-based hospital. We're not a, a affiliated with any major medical college or, or academic medical center. Uh, and yet we, we are on par, I would submit, with the Cleveland Clinics and the Mayo Clinics uh, of, of the country. So um, that's both in terms of volume bed to consult ratio, uh, but also in terms of uh, the qualifications to do the work that we do here. So, um, you know, I think we have been very attentive to the ways we can integrate, the ways we can be more proactive and preventative uh, with the um, uh, anticipating ethical issues. And uh, you will find uh, variation, significant variation in, in other practice settings. Um, you know, there are some hospitals in the country that, uh, uh, their median number of consults in a given year is three. Uh, I mentioned earlier that our, uh, we're in the range of 350 to 400 uh, a year. So um, quite busy compared to the, the, the range that, uh, that's out there. Hallie's gonna get upset with me for uh, running an audible, but uh, one of the benefits of having ethicists uh, present from their workstations is that sometimes we can uh, pull up an article on the fly. And so, you know, what we found out from a recent study that uh, has just been published in uh, 2021 is that the, the models, which can be described by and large in terms of uh, three uh, categorizations, a full ethics committee model, a small team model, or an individual consultant model, which we uh, practice here in Oregon, uh, really does break down the percentage of consults, uh, breaks down along different categorizations. So, 
Um, you'll see, you know, for instance, uh, bed size uh, does uh, change uh, the ways in which, uh, for instance, the full ethics committee model is utilized for your large flagship 500 bed plus hospitals. Less than 10% of those uh, consults are utilizing a full ethics committee. Um, whereas you can also go and compare that uh, of hospitals in urban settings versus rural settings um, and see that by and large our rural um, locations of receiving care uh, do not utilize uh, the individual consultant model um, as highly as uh, urban counterparts or uh, larger teaching hospitals. Um, so it, it really depends of where you're at in the country. It depends on the size of your hospital, the ownership model, um, and uh, uh, urban versus rural, but uh, um, the, there are uh, benefits and um, uh, there, there are pros and cons of each model, um, which we could get into a little bit, um, but uh, we feel like we've got a sweet spot here at the Ethics Center to have uh, individual consultants respond to the lion's share of issues and utilize engagements with uh, small teams and ethics committees um, as necessary. Thank you for that, Kevin. Um, I have one question here from Ann Hill, who is asking, um, should those who refuse to be vaccinated against COVID have to pay increased health insurance premiums or pay hospital expenses from their own pocket? Well, you've taken a couple of tough ones, Nick. Um, I guess uh, I won't sneak off of uh, video and mute now. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, Anne, I would uh, begin with a, a really, uh, I think, a good question like this one um, and uh, begin with, well, what is our starting point? Um, is it the case that we are thinking about what is owed um, from those who uh, perhaps um, have not, for whatever reason, sincerely held religious moral beliefs or otherwise um, uh, caused or promoted um, aspects that have affected um, the health of others? Um, should they be penalized? Should they have to uh, sort of pay back um, some of what was um, uh, exhibited um, uh, by the, the care that they subsequently required? Um, or is this perhaps like um, other public health measures, a kind of a uh, carrot also uh, masquerading potentially as a stick um, in order to promote or boost vaccination rates? Um, at what point um, would the intention uh, in our ethical analysis matter as we think about uh, to what extent would we uh, hope that this would incentivize or uh, force folks who have otherwise been reticent to get vaccinated? So um, again, you know, I think that it's a complicated question um, on a webinar like this. I'd hasten to uh, be able to offer a definitive take on the fly. Um, but I think ethics um, and uh, various uh, principles that we often turn to in thinking through situations ethically uh, could help us start teasing out uh, to what extent ought we uh, think about some potentially significant um, disincentives or even consequences of, uh, as I referred to earlier, not marshalling uh, the responsibility that we may have toward our neighbor. Thanks, Kevin. You know, I, I will just... <clears throat> Add, I mean, it, uh, it's a it's a really interesting question, a great question. Um, I think uh, where my mind goes is uh, there may be some more compelling argument frames around the insurance premium question than the uh, hospital expense um, uh, payment question. Uh, and I suppose my my initial thinking would be, where's the procedural fairness? Uh, I suppose you can. Um, enter into an actuarial evaluation of declining uh, vaccines and what impact that has on your relative risk. But if we start to penalize people at the point of care uh, for engaging in risky behavior, we're going to have we're going to find ourselves in a very thick morass of which risks are acceptable and which risks are not. And and so uh, we may be tempted uh, with. Um, with the current circumstances to point uh, the, the proverbial finger, but uh, that opens us up to some, some real charges of, of fairness uh, in, in how we think about, you know, appropriate behavior in a general society. Thank you for that. Uh, lots of nuances and lots to unpack in that question. Um, I have one more question in our invitation uh, for this doc talk. We teased three different questions and I just want to 
pose one of them to the two of you that I know is a frequent um, ethical dilemma in the Providence hospitals. Um, the question is, should we allow a homeless patient to leave the hospital if he hasn't finished dialysis? Um, so I'll let you uh, give just a couple minutes to help us address how you would go about that question. Sure, well, since I'm already off mute, I'll uh, uh, jump, jump in. And I apologies to those who have heard me uh, say this before, but the easiest ways to sound like an ethicist are to respond, well, it depends uh, or it's complicated. And I think in a case like that, uh, it's both, it depends and it's complicated. You know, I think we would want to be sure that we are honoring that patient as a person and that we're not making uh, assumptions about their uh, ability to exercise their personal autonomy and, and live their life uh, in pursuit of their own liberty. Um, we do have obligations on the other hand to respect, uh, to protect patients from harm. So the, uh, a classic dilemma in a case like that is how do we respect personal autonomy versus how do we demonstrate our commitment to protect from harm? And so it, we, we start to beg questions around, well, are they capable of making their own decisions? Um, what efforts have we tried to uh, marshal onto this case to help the patient um, engage in the safe, in a safe and effective plan of care? Um, what alternatives are there? Um, but ultimately it's, it's about um, understanding that there is only so much that we can do and have we done our due diligence in doing what we can do to honor that person and to do our best to serve their medical good and protect them from harm? Yeah, I might only piggyback to say that uh, in questions around uh, forced medical care, if that's what we're considering for somebody uh, who would otherwise uh, uh, be leaving the hospital, um, we, we need to take those uh, questions with due sensitivity uh, to uh, even if this is a patient who may on close assessment uh, have some gaps in the understanding of the condition or uh, some challenges in demonstrating to us uh, an appreciation for what might happen um, if uh, he or she were to leave the hospital uh, before dialysis had concluded, um, that we also need to think about what are the effects of uh, forcible care um, in those situations, both acutely what would that experience be like for the patient? And also maybe um, more chronically, how might that affect their willingness or ability to seek care in the future and associating doctors and healthcare professionals with people that hold me down and force me to receive care that I don't want to. So again, I'm with Nick, it depends. Um, and oftentimes uh, these cases, you have to get quite uh, granular in the weeds but we also need to think about what are the, uh, the potential harms of uh, a course of treatment. Fantastic, thank you both so much for sharing with us today. Um, really meaningful discussion and for us to learn about how you do your work. Um, if you're inspired by today's presentation and you would like to get involved and learn how you can help, um, please connect with my team. Uh, it's important to note that the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics is 100% funded by philanthropic support. Uh, my information is here on the screen and we'll be sending out a follow-up email in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for making the time today. Our September Doc Talk sponsored by RBC Wealth Management will be Tuesday, September 14th and will feature Providence Senior Health on the topic of reducing the risk of falls for older adults. We hope that you'll join us. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a great afternoon.